Hi, I am Tom Sharp, and I am the front desk manager at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Welcome to the museum and welcome to our monthly lecture series. Each month, we host a different guest lecture, lecturer to share on a topic related to early American history, Vermont history, or the homestead. Our monthly lecture series is part of our larger community enrichment program, and we would like to thank our community enrichment sponsors, M&T Bank and North Country Federal Credit Union. We would also like to thank CCTV and our partners for the monthly lecture series. One of our partners for the monthly lecture series. CCTV records this program and later broadcasts it and allows us to share it on the Homestead's Museums, the Homestead Museum's YouTube channel. This allows us to reach a greater audience and helps the Homestead Museum fulfill its mission to bring history to life. The Ethan Allen Homestead Museum is a community nonprofit. And if you would like to help us continue to offer community enrichment programming, please consider becoming a member, which you can do after the presentation in the gift shop or online. Memberships help the community, memberships help the museum continue its mission, and we thank you for your support. I have the forms all ready to go. It'll take you two minutes. <laughs> after today's presentation, there will be a short Q&A session, and then we'll end with some museum announcements, including some upcoming special events and our next monthly lecture program. I would now, now like to introduce our, who am I introducing? Okay. You. I'm now introducing John Tevenow, who is the president of the board of directors of the Ethan Allen Homestead. Who's going to take it from here? I guess we have it. We did not have a rehearsal, I guess, obviously, for this session today. So thank you for coming. I think we have a few out-of-state visitors with us. We have, is this Minnesota over here? And somebody else from out of state? So I think, so welcome for those of you uh, who are from away, as we say. I am John Devino. I'm the current president of the Board of Directors. Thank you for those of you that put money in the basket out there. I hope that you, your wrist did not get, uh, or your arm didn't get broken by our uh, greeter at the door, who does an excellent job of welcoming folks it when you come in. And thank you for those of you who donate throughout the year. Uh, we do have, we have a, f a fall fund drive and that's usually quite successful and so thank you for, for helping out. As Tom mentioned, these programs would not be possible without the donations of our friends. This is the, uh, I don't, I guess I, I do math so I should go back and count the number of years, but we started in 2007 with this lecture series. So what would that be? That's uh, about uh, 16 years. This is the 156th lecture in our series. We do them every month except the month of December because of the holidays. So, uh, I, I mean, we plan on continuing and expanding our programs as time goes on. So let me take a few moments to introduce our speaker, who is Glenn Fay. Uh, I've known Glenn for a long time. We are fellow educators. Uh, Glenn is a historian, a photographer, uh, he's a descendant of Green Mountain Boy Daniel Champion. Is that correct, Champion? Okay, because I know there, there's another name similar to that, but I had never heard of Daniel uh, Champion. And also of the New Hampshire militiaman John Powers. That's probably where Glenn gets his love of Revolutionary War era history, right? He is also the author of a couple of books, actually probably three books if we count the uh, the little booklet, which I don't know if you're going to mention uh, Fanny's booklet along the way. Uh, he has written The H Hidden History of Burlington. And this one, which I really love, is about Ebenezer Allen, Ethan's cousin who lived in South Hero, where Ethan visited the night before he died. So, and these books will be available afterwards out in the, uh, in our, in the gift shop area. So at this time, Glenn, it's all yours. And would you join me in uh, greeting our speaker, Glenn Fair? So, welcome. And how many of you have read at least one Ethan Allen biography? How many of you have written an Ethan Allen biography? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That'll make my job a lot easier. Um, I'm working on, I've been researching for a couple of years now, a, uh, a book that's tentatively called The Intimate Family Life of 
of Ethan Allen, or Ethan and Fanny Allen. And it's focused on Burlington, right here. And it started out as a, as, as a project to try to get more information on exactly what happened here, and when they came, how they got here, and what their life was like. Um, so it's expanded a little bit, but that's, uh, these slides have been plucked from that, uh, from that project. Uh, the story begins with Felix Powell, who uh, was the first settler in Burlington. And Felix was actually would have known the Allens because he was from Connecticut. And he bought lots, oh, if you're here for this, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> Felix started by buying a couple of lots out on Apple Tree Point, lots 190 and 191, which are choice lakefront today, as you might know. And Felix lasted a couple of years. This was in 1774, uh, and the, the war was just starting to happen. The Redcoats were coming into Vermont with raids, and everybody cleared out in 75. And in fact, the raids did burn down uh, anything they could find, and including Ira Allen's settlement on the river and so forth. Uh, at the same time, Felix bought these two lots right here, number 32 and 35, uh, 32 and 33, which is where we are, right, right here. And um, and Felix, over over the years, he sold those. Um, a man named Marsh, William Marsh, ended up buying them. He was a loyalist, and. That was not a good thing if you owned land in Vermont because Vermont was confiscating loyalist land to sell to fund the militia. And that's just what they did. Ira Allen bought um, the lots 32 and 33, and it ended up going having successive owners over the years or <coughs> sharecroppers. This is the actual deed of of 32 and 33, and it's actually signed by Ira, but it specifies he's buying it for General uh, Ethan Allen. And this is at the State Archives. So he tried, Ethan tried to publish his book in 1782, didn't go very well. The Connecticut printers uh, didn't want to mess with the church. This is a book on reason at a time when religion uh, Puritan re religion was very important. Mary, his first wife, died in 1783 in Sunderland. She's buried here in Arlington Cemetery, uh, in an Arlington Cemetery at the Episcopal Church. So, so this is um, this marks where she was buried, leaving behind um, three daughters. This is a receipt I hadn't seen before. I stumbled upon by accident in the uh, Allen family papers. Um, that is a receipt that shows um, an invoice. It's actually an invoice from Stephen Rowe Bradley, who had a boarding house in Westminster, Vermont. And it's for 18 nights, 55 meals, and a pretty good uh, liquor tab, <clears throat> as per bill. And, and um, Alan was staying in Westminster a lot because there were, uh, he was working with the legislature and he was, uh, Westminster was really quite the hub at that time. Now, Westminster was founded in eight, uh, 1739, I believe, by Massachusetts. So that was the first township in Vermont. It was actually not founded by New Hampshire, but Massachusetts. This is the marriage announcement of Ethan and Fanny, uh, written by Ethan's friend, Anthony Haswell, who was a publisher of the Vermont Gazette in, um, in Bennington. And it describes Fanny as a lady possessing in an eminent degree every graceful qualification 
requisite to render the hymenial bands felicitous? So you probably have to read behind between the lines a little bit on that. So appendix to reason. So after um, Ethan published reason, um, he he had some more work to do on it, and he he wanted to write about the human soul, the immortality of the human soul, and um, and so he published what is loosely called the appendix, um, and this is a picture of it. It's in the the Harvard the Houghton Library at Harvard University. And the library dates it to 1784. And, um, and he writes um, in his, in, in the, um, on the preface here, uh, this appendix to be published at a future day when it will not impinge on my future or present living. And apparently he was feeling the wrath of people threatening him and complaining about his anti-church views, his anti-religious views, um, with his deist philosophy. And the deist philosophy was about God in nature as part of nature. And this was very threatening to the church because he had, Ethan had quite a, a following and he was, for his day, he was not formally educated, but he was articulate enough to be a problem, and and so, so church people were um, yeah, not real happy with him, and you'll see this over and over again. <clears throat> the title for this, the formal title is an essay on the universal plentitude of being, and on the nature and immortality of the human soul, and its agency. So that's the title to give you an idea of Ethan's. Uh, you know, where his head was at with all of this stuff. However, um, Ethan was still trying to get this published. And even as late as 1787, after Reason had been published, he was thinking, yeah, you know, I think he was trying to make money, basically. Because he'd had a best-selling book in his narrative on captivity. So here he writes Royal Tyler, who was in Massachusetts at the time. He was a, a well-educated attorney. And he's asking Tyler, should you proc procure 18 or 20 pound by subscription in ready money? It should shall be published next spring. So he's telling Tyler, I'll publish this if you can help me out a little bit. And if you have any spare change around and uh, and this is on August 28, 1787. So Ethan was in Burlington living here. The family was moved here by then. Uh, we know for sure. And I'll show you how we know in a minute. And by the way, most of these, these slides are, are kind of boring. And it's a lot of, um, I know I'm reading to you, which I don't like to do as a presenter, um, but these are all primary source documents. So they're, you know, if they're primary source, it's hard to argue with them because it, it uh, particularly if they put a time stamp on it and it's signed by someone, there's really not much conjecture there of what was going on. So a lot of these, the book and the slides are, are trying to use primary sources whenever possible or the very best sources that eliminate questions. So what did the Allen siblings, Ethan's siblings, look like in 1787? Surviving, uh, we have Ethan, Ira, and Levi, three boys. Ethan's the oldest. Um, the ones that were lost by 1787 included Lydia, who died at 28, Zimri at 28, Heber, died at 39, Heman, who died at 37, uh, Lucy, um, who died at 26. Also, Ethan's first wife had died at 50, and his son Joseph at 11 or 12, 
and his daughter Lorraine at 20. So, you know, when we think about this uh, in the modern day, you know, standards, this is like, how would you get over this? You know, losing all of your siblings, you know, most of your siblings, um, and it's mostly tuberculosis and um, smallpox, which now, of course, are both uh, preventable. But um, so there, so this is what it looks like in 1787 when he comes here. Now, Levi is an interesting character. Um, he's been called the black sheep of the family, and he's married to a woman named Nancy. Her maiden name was Allen from Connecticut. Um, she lives at St. John, Quebec, up on the Richelieu River, north of here. And so he's a merchant, and he also has racehorses. He, he buys a prince who's an enslaved man in Dutchess County. He's a violent man. He challenges no fewer than three different men, including Ethan, to a duel with pistols. Uh, and ultimately, he dies a pauper in Burlington in one of the debtors' jails. Um, and so this is kind of, Levi is a tragedy of, of the family. Um, and it's unfortunate because he owned probably a good, probably a quarter of the state of Vermont real estate in the 1700s. So I actually have enough for a biography on Levi but I don't want to write it because I don't think anybody would want to read it. It's so depressing. <laughs> and as, and he's, he's a poet. He writes poetry to Nancy back at home and tells her how much he misses her. And then he's gone for a year and a half. And she's having a nervous breakdown in the meantime. Um, so Ira, the third brother, would marry a woman named Jerusha Enos in 1789, they had three kids. Um, he, Ira also housed the widows and children of Heber and Heman um, in his Sunderland home and then in Colchester. Uh, he had a large Colchester home on the Winooski Block site, so that corner of Main Street and East Canal Street with that big block of buildings, of the businesses called the Winooski Block is exactly where Ira had his large mansion there. And we don't have any pictures of it uh, or any more information than that. So in 1787, um, Ira and Ethan, I think it was May 1st, yeah. Um, they signed a termination agreement for the Onion River Land Company, which was the original company of, of partners of some of the Allen brothers and remember Baker. So in that agreement, Ethan gave up all of the mill sites, Ira, retained half of lot 33, which was right on the river. Um, and they gained supposedly 1,000 acres of land on Burlington Bay that had been Heman's, that Heman had given them, at which Ira had paid taxes on. Ira also gave Ethan 700 pounds of worth of merchandise a year for the next, I believe it was 10 years, but I could be wrong. Now, what's sad about this is Ethan only lived a year and a half longer than this contract. So this is part of the lawsuit where Fanny and Jebez Pennyman uh, would sue Ira to regain those 1,000 acres or a share of the 1,000 acres and the 700 pounds and so on and so forth. So the move to Burlington happened sometime in 1787. Wow, that color is really rich. Uh, and so they were living in Sunderland, down here south of Manchester, 
and there's a little red line that approximates how they might have um, traveled. Um, and we know from a letter that Ethan was looking for cordage or rope for a sailboat to sail, to move the family up the lake to Burlington. And water was by far the easiest and the fastest way to Burlington because there was no road except for a horse path between here and Middlebury. Um, and the description of this, of the path on land is like nothing you've ever seen. It, it wouldn't have, you couldn't have hauled an ox cart. Um, so, the, however, the southern part of the state did have some paths and some roads. And what I think happened was he probably had the boat, if he did have a boat and, and moved the family by boat, it would have been from Skeensboro, which is Whitehall, or Crown Point, um, Chimney Point area. So the boat would have been there. Um, he would have moved probably with, you know, hauled wagons to load the boat. He actually brought cows with him, according to Fanny. And so it would have been, um, it probably would have been at least a week over land and another week on the water if they had good winds. Um, but they would be, would have been rowing too. So the, the conditions in, the, in that time period in this frontier area of Burlington were, um, were pretty difficult to say the least. And now being on the river had its advantages because the river is, a, is the main transportation artery. It's like being on the main road. And, and again, they probably had boats down here and they probably used them while they were here. So, so what did the Allen family look like who moved to Burlington? I hope we get a chance to find out. Nope. Oh. Um, so Ethan, 49 years old. Fanny, 27 years young. Lucy Caroline, by his first marriage, 19, Marianne, 15, Pamela, 8, are coming with them along with their daughter, Fanny Margaret, who, who um, Fanny had when she, in uh, 1784, in Sunderland. And Hannibal Montresor was born, we know, on of November 28th. So the household also included two black men, one named Newport, a black housekeeper, and possibly others. And we know this from accounts, sworn affidavits in, that were actually published in the Burlington paper at the time. We know all that. Um, and so that's quite a, quite a family. So Burlington at the time was a, um, there were supposedly, I, I read out here at the museum, I'm not sure where this data is from, but there were supposedly 40 dwellings in Burlington, but Bur Burlington included South Burlington and included parts of uh, you know, Williston and Richmond, it was 36,000 acres. So there were some spread out houses, but a lot of them on the bay, a uh, half a dozen or a dozen, and then a half a dozen or dozen on the river across from the mill uh, where there were actually mills by then. And so we have a couple of folks uh, just to note here uh, who were friends of the Allens um, include, this is, these are the Lawrences on Lime Kiln Road right by the bridge mm -hmm. near St. Mike's. This is Ira Allen's place at the, at the dam. Uh, this is the Allen Homestead where we are right now. Felix Powell out on the point there. And the C is for the Collinses on Battery Street. And that was where Fanny gave birth in November. And 
Uh, what we have is information from John Collins' son that said the, uh, that the Allens lived with them for three months before Fanny gave birth to Hannibal. So we know she gave birth on November 28th, so if we backtrack three months, looks like August is when they arrived here in Burlington. Now that doesn't mean Ethan wasn't here beforehand. Um, and because we have documents that were written, like letters that were dated and, uh, and, and time uh, place stamped in Burlington. Uh, there was a, um, a, a, a celebration on August 10th um, a colonial celebration of the first uh, anniversary of um, you know the people that that lived here every year, and that was uh, this comes from Hulda Lawrence, who is the daughter. She's six years old when Ethan dies, so she has a working memory of of seeing Ethan Allen in the casket, in the house. Uh, she has a um, working memory of the Allens coming over to their house by Limekiln Bridge on the Burlington side. Um, and she says her father, Stephen Lawrence, and her mother, Mary, um, both were here before 75, along with Felix Powell. And then after 76, Gideon King, Sr., Job Boynton, these guys are on the bay. Um, and they're the predecessors to the shipping industry that, that arises. Fred Saxton, Simon Tubbs, John Collins, all uh, arrived around the same time. Now she says after the war, the war technically didn't end until 1783, but I think I've seen evidence that they were here before that. So things might have been simmering down up here enough so people felt safe to come um, to come up here. So this is a letter to Stephen Rowe Bradley, and Stephen was the guy who had the boarding house, who um, where Ethan and Fanny got married. And Ethan writes here, you know, talking about how great it is. He's got all this land, and he's smitten with the lifestyle of, of a farmer. But this guy, Bradley, uh, went on after Ethan died to become uh, a district judge, a member of the Vermont House uh, on the Supreme Court, and the U.S. Senate uh, President Pro Tem, so he was um, he was a you know major um, guy, and and he and Ethan were very close. We have lots of correspondence between the two, um, and Ethan was trying to get him to get the Fanny's land back because her father was a uh, loyalist, and they had confiscated. His, his land as well. So typically on, on farms um, in the 18th century, um, there were beef cows. Um, Alan talked about selling beef cattle. So we, th we think it's safe bet that they had beef cattle here, milking cows, calves, mares, possibly sheep, pigs, hogs, a horse. Um, they had a yoke of oxen that, um, and we know they grew corn, uh, wheat, um, peas, flax for linen, medicinal plants, and, and so forth as well here. But, you know, we don't specifically, beyond what we find in letters or some of the, you know, the different anecdotes, we don't really know any more than that. This is a letter to Levi noticed the date, January 29, 1787. So they, he hasn't moved the family here yet. This is the beginning of the year. And he's, he's asking Levi to exert a little skill. You know, he could be talking about intimidation, 
You could be talking about negotiating some kind of compromise. But it sounds like Ethan owes Armstrong, it's a small amount, like 15 pounds, which isn't a lot of money. And he's trying to get Levi to kind of help him out. Um, kind of gets to the Ethan's personality and how they work together. Um, June 3rd, 1787, um, he's, he writes Ethan again. And again, there's no mail delivery. So Ethan sends one of his workers up the Richelieu River, maybe with letters for other people. And, he's, and he says, you know, we really need flour. We need, uh, we don't have money. Uh, there's, cash is very scarce. Um, my farming business goes on very brisk. But I come up for seed corn, do not family fail us. Uh, here my family is well. My compliments to Mrs. Allen, referring to Nancy. <coughs> and so here's a letter from Nancy to Ethan, and it may be one of my favorites um, from the from the uh, all of these. And it's, it says, it's on June 28th, 1787, and, and it says, have just time to inform you of your brother's safe arrival at Quebec with a small quantity of lumber. So they're sawing lumber at the river, floating it down the river, taking it up Lake Champlain to Richelieu River to the trading post, and, and then Levi is finding a way to ship it up to Quebec from there. So you're actually you know, trying to make a go of selling timber, uncut lumber and lumber. Um, and he wrote me he had reason to believe should be successful, wish to God he may for repeated misfortunes have almost turned my brains, she says. I'm in great, great want of tables and my tables and chairs and bedsteads. Do be kind enough to get them made as soon as possible. Ethan Allen Furniture, right there. <laughs> Dare say you have enough to do to take care of your business and your large family of children, for I hear you have at least one dozen. <laughs> Well done, old rogue. <laughs> Shall have to put a poor opinion, have but a poor opinion of you after this. I wish you a speedy reformation. Talking about when you move the family up. So it's, it's June, end of June, family's not here yet. Nowhere does Nancy offer regards to Fanny, Ethan's wife of three or four years which is maybe a coincidence. And the, the book has a chapter on the mysteries of the Allen's house, what it was like to live there, um, the kinds of uh, quarters they had in that square footage, um, and you know, uh, lots of good things like that from living historians who um, know. So reactions to Reason, the only Oracle of Man book, um, for one thing, there was a fire when his book copies were being printed that destroyed most of them. And some people think it was intentionally set, um, but this was kind of, a, it's kind of a big deal. So he only ended up with a few hundred copies of this book. Um, here's a letter that was published in the Burlington paper, originally published in the Vermont Gazette on uh, January 2nd, uh, 1788. He says, remember before it is too late for these things, you, your offended God will call you into judgment. And, you know, threatening him with punishment by, by God. And uh, 
Reverend Nathan Perkins, who did a tour of New England in uh, 1789, the year Ethan died, later that year, came through. And it's too bad Ethan was, wasn't still here. It would have been an interesting debate. But Perkins writes in his journal, Alan was an awful infidel, one of ye wickedest men that ever walked this guilty globe. I stopped and looked at his grave with a pious horror. So he actually goes up to Green Mount Cemetery, if you can believe this, um, and, and, you know, shakes his head. Um, and this Perkins was a, you know, was, was uh, he, ba he also said <laughs> that after, you know, touring Vermont, which was just a, you know, it's like you couldn't find a, any place that wasn't filthy and gross and nasty and decrepit, that uh, Vermont was just full of heathens, just a bunch of heathens, he said. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, and then uh, this is a June 5th, 1788 um, settlement with his brother Levi for 100 pounds. Levi pays Ethan 100 pounds. We don't know what for. 100 pounds is a lot of money. I forget, I think it's 3,000. So it's a, it's a chunk of change. Notice who witnessed it on the bottom. Lucy Caroline Allen and Mary Ann Allen, his two daughters. So this was signed while they were living here. Um, and Levi was visiting. And they also, Ethan, Ira, and Levi journeyed up to Montreal, probably over water, um, and Quebec to talk with General Haldeman to push Vermont Canada trade. And Ethan actually wrote a letter to Lord Dorchester, who is Guy Carleton, who war historians will know as a British uh, general, um, weighing the potential of Vermont's allegiance with the U.S. versus Great, Great Britain. So this is um, a Canadian Archives uh, painting of St. John, what St. John looked like at the time, which is basically a, a little town with a fort. So Fanny's, um, Fanny was really um, a pretty interesting character. Uh, first of all, she, her father is the guy in uniform on the left, uh, Captain John Montresor, who was an engineer with um, the British Army. Um, her mother died in childbirth or shortly thereafter. Um, she, was, um, her, she was raised by her aunt in mostly New York City where uh, in a, her, her aunt married Crean Brush, who's the man up at the top. Colonel Crean Brush was a uh, uh, British, um, Irish-born um, aristocrat who made his way into the New York legislature and became a land baron. He had 60,000 acres in Westminster. So before too long, when Fanny was about 11, when this portrait was painted, they moved to Westminster, Vermont, and onto this brush estate. And they lived there for a while. So Fanny lived a, an extravagant lifestyle. They probably had servants. Um, she had private tutoring. Uh, girls couldn't go to school then. Uh, they, there were girls' schools in some places. But uh, Fanny was educated in the classics, in la languages, in science, um, in music, and so forth. So she was a really kind of a talented, privileged uh, person. Um, and these are her slippers that are at uh, Fort Ticonderoga, her biology kit with magnifying glasses and so forth, and some earrings um, that are also at Fort Ty. So Fanny is, um, she, she's in this different culture than Ethan Allen grew up in on the farm. Um, and there are some accounts, historical accounts, of there being friction 
between Fanny and Ethan's first um, kids, the girls, um, including Lucy Caroline and Pamela and Marianne and so forth. Um, but I couldn't find any primary sources that, that showed that yet. However, this is an interesting letter from Sam Hitchcock, who's in Bennington, um, to, to Lucy, who is in Burlington or Virgins. They lived in Burlington for a few years and in Virgins for a few years. Um, he says, I shall be obliged to call and see our chaste, discreet, and virtuous mother. He's talking about going to Westminster. Shall I express a great deal of love to her on your account? I shall be glad to see the little boys, this is Ethan and Hannibal, and on this account shall call, but I should be happily disappointed if she should be from home. So this is really a, an interesting piece, and um, it gets to the family dynamics a little bit of at least one person, uh, Sam Hitchcock, who's a big time lawyer, and a Harvard law, you know, Harvard graduate, and then uh, you know, lawyer who came to Vermont and became, uh, you know, rose to to different offices. Another letter that was interesting was a, a letter from Ira to Fanny in 1802. And by the way, the Hitchcock letter was in 1791, two years after Ethan had died. So Ira to Fanny in 1802. He's incredulous and. Adamant, he says he's not the guardian of the boys, of the two little, um, Fanny's little boys. I shall feel it a duty I owe to the memory of my brother and you as parent, to three of his children to advise you for their best good as occasions from, may, from time to time require. Mrs. Allen, his wife Jerusha, will more fully explain my reasons for writing you this letter and inform you of some other things that may be useful to you in more ways than one, and which I have not time to state in a letter. So this, um, Iroh is not the, you know, he's kind of a godfather for the whole family. He supported everybody. But it's clear that he was getting uh, pretty fed up with supporting the, the boys. And in the meantime, Jabez Pennyman and Fanny are doing pretty well. Um, by 1802, they had four kids of their own, Jabez Pennyman and Fanny's new husband and Fanny. And he was collector of customs up in Swan. So maybe an Ira, Ira is looking at all this debt, and he's seeing Jabez doing pretty well, and why should I be supporting um, the Allen? Again, that's conjecture, but, but that's what the letter said. So these are oxen, and oxen were, um, the Allens took frequent trips into town um, on ox carts, and according to accounts, people wrote, um, and they're very slow. They go about two miles an hour, top speed, if they're motivated. So, it would take, you know, it'd be an all-day trip going into the bay and back or out to Colchester uh, Point. So here's a little bit about Levi. Um, this letter is, notice the date. It's um, a couple of weeks before Ethan dies. And Levi is telling Ethan about his grand plan. So the fact that he's telling Ethan this tells us that he isn't really that intimate with Ethan, that these two are not, they, they don't really know necessarily exactly who's, you know, what they're doing. But um, Levi and Ira had been cooking up this, this uh, scheme in fact, Levi became Ira's power of attorney. And this, this first, uh, on this broadside on the left is a British Navy poster 
that's asking for ship mass, large trees, four or five feet in diameter, that the British Navy would pay good money for to buy. So Levi had this plan that he would, they would harvest the infinite timber here in Vermont, sell it to the British Navy, and get rich. So Levi actually is planning to go to Great Britain. He gets delayed by three or four months because of contrary winds. So he literally sits around. He's up at Ebenezer's for a week or two. He's, you know, all over the state. Meanwhile, Nancy is up at the, well, in January, Nancy was probably at Ira's place hanging out for the winter. But, um, but he says, Nancy's situation is truly bad. Um, I was much pleased to see Fanny make you and everything easy. So I don't know exactly what he's talking about. This is clipped from a, a longer letter that's not really explanatory. But Levi left behind lots of journals. So there's, there's lots of stuff to read, mostly just account books. Um, and this is kind of what it would have, the shipping ports uh, would have looked like at the time. So what's really strange about this is this is the last correspondence we have of Levi to Ethan. Levi does finally go to London about the time, about the day Ethan dies. Levi doesn't find out until June for some reason. This is a letter from John Kelly, who's a New York City lawyer, big time out of state uh, landowner. Um, he basically says, you and Ira owe me a lot of money. I think he was trying to get the Brush estate back for Fanny and Ethan. And he was part of, but in order to do that, he had to, they had to pony up some money and you know things were a little slow right then. Cash was non-existent. So he's complaining that, you know, I, I need my money and in order to make this work. So everybody knows the story of Ethan's last journey and on the ox cart, plodding two miles an hour. And, um, and this is a newspaper article that, that basically laid out the funeral procession from Ira's place in Winooski now, used to be Colchester, going across the river, hauling three cannons every three minutes. Cannons would fire, uh, or every minute. Uh, six platoons of infantry, uh, field officers with drawn swords, officers, magistrates, spectators, muskets were fired. Major B Bill Goodrich is the only person who spoke. They did not want any religion at this funeral. And they opened the casket one final time, closed it, lowered it into the ground, and the procession marched back down the hill uh, to muffled drums um, back to Ira's house, and they had a keg of rum tapped for the celebration afterwards. Does anyone know who this is? So this, um, if you read any of the old biographies, um, you'll read about all this controversy about Ethan's grave and was he really buried there or did Fanny dig him up and bury him in Montreal under the Citadel or, you know, there's all kinds of weird conspiracy theories. Well, they actually found, when they were making that monument in 1858, they actually, um, Ira Allen's son, Ira Hayden Allen, writes John Norton Pomeroy, who's the head of the committee, of the monument committee, uh, to tell him that they had dug under the grave where everybody thought his grave was, and they found the body. They found Ethan in his casket. Um, it was deeper than they had looked before, but it was there unmistakably. And this guy gets wind of it because it's in the papers. John uh, um, Mead and um, 
And he wants to, he asks if he can come up and measure Ethan's cranium for his statue design. He was not successful in measuring Ethan's cranium. So um, John Wheelock, who Ethan had been writing back and forth, uh, president of Dartmouth, writes him the day after Ethan dies, February 13th. The observations in your letters give me much pleasure. And for my idea of your philosophic and contemplative turn, persuaded I am that you will be, uh, by sublime reason, pervade the name, uh, the maze of atheism into the region of theism. And Silas Baron Hathaway, who sued um, Ira into further bankruptcy and debtor's prison, said, and this is in the Burlington paper, though possessing many eccentricities peculiar to himself, Ethan exhibited through his life a strong sense of honor, an invincible spirit of patriotism. And he goes on to say he didn't give bonds or IOUs, and he left cash to pay three men his unpaid bills. So um, he, of course, did use some IOUs, but basically, the way people survived was on IOUs because there really was no cash um, because of the economy and, the, and currency. Um, and this uh, testimonial from Holly Witters, who was 17, worked here on the homestead. Ethan always paid up on time. After he died, Ira Allen paid us our due wages. So, uh, and Fanny also apparently paid wages after they were, after Ethan was gone as well. So what happened after uh, Ethan was Lucy Caroline, his daughter, married Sam Hitchcock in April, two months, three months later. They had five, six kids. One of them was Ethan Allen Hitchcock, who according to Lucy, uh, had a strong resemblance to his grandfather, Ethan Allen. And he became a general and uh, aide of uh, President Lincoln, interestingly enough. So this guy was born eight months after Ethan died, Ethan Alfonso Allen. There's no evidence anywhere for Voltaire. It is sometimes called Ethan Voltaire Alfonso. Um, his uh, West Point graduation information says Ethan Alfonso, and he lived a long life. And in the meantime, the next following year, Mary Ann, his daughter, died. And Fanny returned the remaining family to Westminster to live with um, Margaret and her husband, Patrick Wall. Pamela may have stayed behind and lived with the Hitchcocks. So there are some historians that say both Mary Ann and Pamela did the two remaining series sisters, but Marianne died in 1790. So Fanny's in Westminster again. She meets, among other people, a man named Dr. Jabez Pennyman, and she marries Pennyman in 1793. They have four kids, very interesting names, European um, kind of classic names with middle names, Julieta Hortensia. Udney is named after their attorney, Udney Hay, and Adelia. And they move back into the homestead here, believe it or not. Um, I think Jabez built a frame house in addition to the original house and a carriage barn. And in 1801, he was appointed by the president to U.S. Customs Collector, Later, after a few years, uh, they, they lived in a farmhouse on the southeast corner of Route 15 and Lime Kiln Road for decades, very happily ever after. 
The Dunbar Motel, by the way, was built on the Pennyman Farm. Um, it became the site of Fannie Allen Hospital and part of the UVM Medical Center. And it's actually named after another Fannie Allen, little Fannie Margaret, who was the daughter of, first daughter of Ethan and, and uh, Fannie. She was 10 years old when Fannie married Jabez Pennyman. And of course, her becoming a, a Catholic nun was a big deal back then. There were no Catholics in Vermont until the late uh, 1700s because, they, you know, the Catholics were the mill workers and um, they're, they're, that, that did come into Burlington, immigrated to Burlington. But at that time, this was a big deal because Ethan was a deist. He was not into re organized religion at all. Um, but she attended Middlebury Seminary for girls and Emma Willard School and went to Montreal. Um, this is a little bit of, about Fanny's charm, which I think is really interesting. It's a letter from Jabez Pennyman to Stephen Rowe Bradley, and, it, and it's basically indicates, several letters indicate that Bradley's mother was staying with, either with the Pennymans or nearby. She was under the watchful eye of Dr. Pennyman. So Bradley's older mother is, is under the watchful eye of Dr. Pennyman. And this is a PS at the end of the letter. Mrs. Pennyman and Miss Fanny Allen join me in respects to yourself and Mrs. Bradley. Fanny proposes to visit Westminster in May when she will pay her personal respects to yourself and her much esteemed friend, your good lady. So those are all we have of Fanny's direct, uh, indirect words. We don't have any letters written by Fanny um, anywhere that we've found anywhere. And then we have um, another interesting letter. Anybody who's ever been a teenager can relate to this. This is from Ethan Alfonso, who's 19 now, in uh, 1808. He's writing Zimmery Enos Allen, who's 16. I am head over ears in love with a fine young lady, but dare not proceed farther on account of the displeasure of my parents and which is full and great an obstacle to the union is my use and circumstances in life. When I make myself master of the mines of Peru, I shall then get me a companion. Meaning when he has money and he's earned his fortune, maybe it'll work out then. And what's interesting is he, he actually married twice after that, later in, in life. Um, lost his first wife. And here's another excerpt, and we're almost finished. I'm going a little longer than I wanted. Um, these are in the same Burlington paper. Um, two quotes by stepfather and son. Pennyman, who is the co collector of customs, says, rafts as well as vessels must be prevented from proceeding to a foreign port, meaning any place in Canada. And for that purpose, one or two armed boats may, if necessary, be stationed near the line. Allen writes a letter. This is Ethan Allen, Jr. This fag end of the embargo goes to prohibit the farmers of Vermont and New Hampshire from driving their swine into Canada for sale, an anti-Republican act. And it turned out that the actual trade during the embargo of 1808 actually increased during the embargo. So um, I think this is the last real slide. It's, it's about Fanny and Adelia collecting wildflowers. If you look closely, you can see their handwriting on these. They 
Uh, they uh, looked up the scientific names, um, and they looked up the floriography, or they knew the floriography, which are the romantic flower names for different flowers, and they comprised this collection of hundreds of wildflowers, which were um, found their way back to UVM's Pringle Herbarium, and they're, narr they're actually online if you Google it or contact UVM, and you can, you can see their digital photos, but we had them here at the homestead last fall, and it was really amazing. But these two guys are two Paris botanists, father and son, who came at different times to Vermont at that time period, late 1700s, early 1800s. And, um, and this book had been published around the turn of the century on scientific nomenclature, so it was just starting to be a thing. So Fanny was really ahead of her time. I mean, not only was she educated and, and, and smart, but she knew how to do things and wanted to do things. And um, it's a really interesting, interesting uh, collection. So um, that's about it. I have, uh, there's more in the book about uh, the slavery question. Uh, there's more about the impact on Vermont's DNA on unique DNA that we have politically here and how the, our beginnings kind of affected that and influenced that. Um, and um, that's about it. I have a few books if people want to hang around, if, if anyone's interested in chatting or uh, getting a sign book. Questions? Uh we take a couple questions. Go ahead, time. When is your book coming out? This was great. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's I, the more you dig, the more you find, and it's <laughs> it's very it's rich. Um, and but I'm to a point now where I have pretty much a a draft that's coherent enough to actually send out and see you know, who might be interested in it. It's not a very good time to be publishing history of old white dudes. Okay. And, you know, so, you know, and I may end up doing it myself, self-publishing. I haven't done any myself yet, but, but that's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, you said a couple of times that Ethan was a deist, and in fact, there were a lot of uh, early uh, American leaders who were deists. But I understood that he rejected deism uh, in his book, uh, you know, A Reason the Only Oracle of Mankind, and that he argued with uh, Dr. Thomas Young, I think, about this. Uh, Young was a deist, and uh, Ethan Allen you know, rejected even that. You, know, you, you don't have to propose a God to explain how the world got going, which is what a deist is. Do you feel that he was a deist? Well, I think, Glenn, for the yeah. purpose of the recording, can you kind of summarize the question in the microphone, please? Oh, um, yes. Um, Ethan, at various times, claimed he was a deist and not a deist. And, and depending on the interpretation of the historian, um, and there are some Thomas Young biographers out there, and there are people that say Ethan plagiarized. Plagiarism wasn't a law when this was published. It wasn't even a thing. So he was criticized for, for plagiarizing, I think, because the church really hated this book. And um, more, moreover than, you know, but, and there was also an agreement that whoever outlives the other will publish this between them, some biographers say. Um, but I think the point you're trying to get at is, was he a deist, capital D, deist or not. And there are, you know, it really depends on your interpretation. Ethan was very argumentative. And so he could probably argue both sides of that argument. Um, so uh, that's a question that could go on for a long time at the tavern here if you want to hang around. <laughs> yeah. Just a comment Tom, on that. We do have copies of the original. Yeah. Uh, it's an abridged version, but we do have those. We also have a little booklet that Michael McKnight, who taught at Champlain College and gave a talk here, and I think it was in 2010, 
which is a little summary. It's about 10 pages, but it's one page for every chapter of the book. And that really is a very good place. But he does say, he does believe in a supreme being, because he says in there, uh, God is infinite and therefore cannot be jealous. He's criticizing the Old Testament version of the time that, you know, a jealous God would bring down wrath on, on people. So it is a very interesting read. Angie. Um, I have a question about Ira. The uh, quick thing, summary you had up about Ira, um, Ethan's brother, um, was that he, he had in there that he took in his late brother's widows and children, and it's often assumed that Ethan's daughter's from his first wife may have also gone to Iris' household after, right after Ethan died before Lucy got married. Um, Ethan was the elder brother. Why wasn't he taking in his late brother's widows and and children? And or maybe the timeline is just off from when I from when that happened. But that just stuck out to me because Ira was the younger brother. And you would think Ethan, as the head of the family, may have done that, and also because. Ira tends to get a really bad rap in Vermont. Um, his legacy um, is not as unspoiled as Ethan's has been throughout time. And I just wonder if Ira deserves that reputation or not. OK, so two parts of the question, right? So um, Ethan was in prison when Heman and Heber died. And in fact, he was released about the time Heman died. He went to visit Heman. He had just died. Um, so both of their wives and children needed a place to go. So um, Mary, by the way, I think, some think, stayed with Ira too in Sunderland. So he's got this place in Sunderland. There's a B&B &B called the Ira Allen B&B &B in Sunderland, Vermont, just south of Manchester. They claim is the original building, the original Ira Allen building. So, so there's there's that. In terms of um, in terms of his Ira's standing, um, you know, Ira's a complicated guy, and he um, uh, his biographer who wrote a dissertation on him, Kevin Greffinino, um, basically concluded that he wanted to overthrow the Canadian government. And he went, that's why he went to Europe, to get the guns and the cannons. And that was his intention, to arm the Vermont militia so they could, they could overthrow Canada. When he was um, in debtor's prison here in Burlington, and then he left for Philadelphia um, to escape debtor's prison, um, he was trying to plan a war down south with Mexico. And so he had all these kind of schemes going on. Meanwhile, he's got a mountain of debt. He's prom making promises he can't keep. So he's a really complicated character. But he donated the land for, for UVM. Um, his, one of his uh, nephews got the money, the cash, after he left town. Somehow squeezed the cash out to give UVM that, that he, Ira had promised. So, so they're two different people. As to the conjecture that the girls went to live with Ira, you know, it's conjecture. And until I see primary sources that show something more than that, um, I had seen it was the Hitchcocks, but you have different historians saying different things. So it looked like there was some bad blood, but we don't know exactly. All right, thank you, Glenn. I think you're going to be outside. Yeah. Uh, you're you're outside. Outside. Uh, help yourself with the refreshments that we have up there. Before you head up, real quick, Tom has uh, the list of the events coming up. I think I can probably just step in real quick. We have, yeah. Um, we have our quarterly book club is uh, reading a book that's for sale in the bookshop. It's a historic fiction book set in revolutionary Boston, and that will be on August 6th at 3 p.m. And next month, our presentation is July 19th. Can you double check the date for okay. that for our monthly lecture? No glasses. And that uh, is with the Vermont historical um, or 
the Vermont Holocaust Memorial. And they have a couple speakers coming in to present on the connections between the Holocaust and Vermont and their memorial project as well. So that will be Sunday, July 16th at 2 p.m. Thank you, everyone.